Hi, I'm Ava Liebteg. Welcome back to What Did You Learn? I'm excited to be here with my longtime colleague, Leslie O'Flahaven, who is the principal of eWrite. eWrite is a writing and training consultancy, so we have a lot in common. We're both passionate about plain language. So I'm really excited today to have a conversation with Leslie. Welcome. Thanks a lot, Ahav. I'm so glad to speak with you. Yeah, it's good to see you. We were just talking about how we're really like what? A mile and a half apart. Yeah, something. very close. In fact, if we raise our voices, maybe we could just there shout the session. There yeah. you go, over the muffled <laughs> snow. So, Leslie, tell me about how you spent your time during the pandemic. <laughs> well, <laughs> I spent my time with an enlarged household. Before the pandemic, our household was a quiet household of two two people, myself and my husband, and then our daughter and our two grandchildren moved in. So we have five of us now and two of us, uh, two of the five are toddlers. Oh, <laughs> so wow. it's a, a lot and happy and uh, busy place. That's exciting. You know, I always think when I see little children and I'm watching them learn how to talk, I learn a lot about writing because you see the way they put things together and it makes you realize how complex English grammar really is. So that was probably like a little bit fun for you, right? To see the way they put things together. Indeed, indeed, that's happening all the time. And it is it is funny. My, my grandson is at the place where um, gawk could mean sock, stuck, stinky, good or dog. Yes. So you're right. <laughs> I remember when I learned about categorization for user experience and information architecture. One of the things that I use as an example is when you show a developing child the color blue, aqua, to like whatever it is, they're going to say blue because they understand that blue covers all of these different color blues. And I always thought that was so fascinating that we're just built to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that we look for patterns and groupings just automatically. So mm -hmm. that's really fun. So let's turn to plain language and the pandemic. What do you wish you had known about the way that this was going to be communicated to people? And what do you think we could have done differently to have made it easier? Do you think there's anything that we could have done differently? I do think there's things we could have done differently. And I certainly wish we, our culture, our community and individual writing practices had been different. Um, what, as the months have dragged on and as, as it's become clearer that communicating clearly is a life or death challenge, um, I've, I've developed this yearning for the voice and the style of the communicators who are sharing health information about COVID to be more like the voice and style of that one friend we all have who can speak to you about anything. This is the friend who's not afraid to speak with you after a loved one has died. She never thinks, I don't know what to say, so I won't say anything. And this is a friend who can ask you uh, private questions. You have an illness, she can ask you about your symptoms. This is a friend who can tell you that you misspoke to her and tell it to you straight so you're not wounded, but you're grateful. We need that candor and confidence in communications, and it is sorely lacking, sorely lacking at the federal level, at the practitioner level, it's missing. So what would you tell, you know, somebody who is writing this vaccine content, whether it's for a healthcare organization or as an employee internal communicator that needs to say to people like, you got to get this shot, what would you tell them to turn to as a tools to help them get more empathetic, get more clear communications, what would you tell them to do as a writing teacher? As a writing teacher, through and through, lifelong, that is who I am. As a writing teacher, I would tell them, get your message straight in your head first. Be able to speak your message straight. You don't have to worry about right away about the, the word craft here. Get your message straight because you're confusing us. We don't know what your message is. So if your message is, we have no vaccine, get that straight in your head first and be prepared to express it in words that don't insult, but definitely in words that don't muddy the message. And then, you know, when you were talking about brands and their um, increasing 
comfort with sympathy and empathy. I think, yes, some are good at it, some are not. Some it's so cheesy, you need a cheese cutter just to get through it. I think brands are getting better at talking about feelings or writing about feelings, and that may be enough. I don't need brands to express the empathy to me that someone I love should express or that someone that knows me as a person should express. That's, I don't have that relationship with Burger King or with Target. But I do think that if they can uh, phrase the uh, emotion the reader is likely to be feeling, it comes across as connected. And right. that may be enough. Right. And so th that's an interesting thing because I've been looking at a lot of these examples. And one example I came across was from the shoe store DSW. And they sent an email to a friend of mine who has an extremely um, generous amount of shoes. Let's put it that way. And she <laughs> loves shopping there. And the email said, um, you know, her name. And it's like, it's been a really rough year. Treat yourself to a pair of shoes. And it was so funny because at first I looked at that and I thought, oh, that's really great. Like, it's really great. But then I was thinking, what if they sent that to somebody who had a relative who died? Indeed. Or Indeed. was really, really sick. Like, uh, treating myself to a pair of shoes is not going to make me feel better. Like, I've had the worst year of my life. Right. And so it, it's an interesting, it's, it is really interesting and it is really complex to know how to take these delicate situations and really hit that fine line. And so I love that idea of like, get it in your head. One of the things that I always tell writers is write and then layer in voice and tone on second draft. Like get the ideas out on the screen or the paper or whatever. And then you can go back in and massage it and move things around. I mean, we have to cut and paste now. Like it's not that difficult. <laughs> Indeed. But I, I, I do. It's, it's so interesting to talk to somebody else who feels that way about writing because I just, I think sometimes we try too hard to get it right on the first draft and that first draft is usually always a little bit ugly. And Indeed. Always, and it's not only that the, uh, it's not only that um, challenge writers always experience of like getting it out and then making it good. Definitely. That's a challenge. But I'm asking, what is your main point? What, irrespective of any words you might choose, what is your main point? And I love the point you made about the uh, blitheness <laughs> or the cluelessness of the DSW email. This is privilege. This is where social justice and communicating about the pandemic cross because you're absolutely right. If a person has experienced a death in their immediate family from COVID, that is beyond insulting. And DSW cannot possibly know, cannot possibly know whether you've experienced this. So they have to watch their message. Now that there's a new administration and there seems to be breathing room around transparency and science and you know, Fauci coming out and saying, yeah, nobody wanted to listen to me. And now I think they do. Um, what would you tell a federal communicator who has to create content now around the vaccine rollout, around the rest of the pandemic? What would you tell them to, to bring to meetings, to talk about with colleagues in order to sort of reset the message because you know like the Kaiser Family Foundation did a study and they found that the CDC's website dropped 19 points in credibility right like scary so what would you tell them you know how would you instruct them well um I would definitely instruct them to look for the uh web community the content communicators who have been excellent for 20 years across um, across leadership, across political party, even across uh, mission. Sometimes the mission changes because you're right. I do feel for the uh, federal communicators, they have had a bad four years. They really, really have. They've had a shutdown four years. But we have some agencies in the federal government that have been fed, uh, plain language heroes for a long time. The Plain Writing Act is 10 years old. They're, they've been doing it great for, for a long time. I would say stop arguing about, con or stop even advocating for content quality decisions or writing decisions in the abstract. You have exemplars use them. So, you know, turn to uh, the National Cancer Institute if you have to talk about illness and turn to the um, CFPB if you have to talk about money. You turn to the SEC if you have to talk about money. If you have to talk about statistics, turn to the Energy Information Administration. We have heroes. And just, I would say for the communicators, be like, yeah, 
I want to do that. What they're doing, that's what I want to do. So, so we don't have to renegotiate because if someone is, if a federal communicator or team is publishing excellent content that is, in fact, award-winning without exaggerating, can be where the metrics can document the quality and the use, just turn to these as models. I love that idea, right? Look for the bright spots. That's a really Yeah, good they're idea. there and they've been there for a long time, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I also want to talk about something else. So it seems to me that, you know, there's this new sort of, not new discipline, but they've renamed content strategy, copywriting, that kind of thing as content design or UX writing. Mm -hmm. And there seems to really be this sort of um, uh, embrace of more visual techniques to communicate information. Mm -hmm. And I actually, that totally jives with my plain language viewpoint. When the pandemic started and we were seeing all these examples of like six feet, six feet, six feet, we were like, that's a surfboard, that's a bicycle, that's two <laughs> grocery parts, you know, like sometimes you just have to visualize things. In your head, do you have a way where when you're writing or you're teaching writing, you'll say, this is a time for a visual or, because I think the words always need to be there, but how do you reinforce the idea and how do you know in the back of your head or the front of your head or your gut or your experience to sort of communicate that to writers who really depend on words and sometimes should move to visuals or the opposite, visual people who you know, need to think about words. That's a lovely and, and important question. And um, I'm gonna give like a, a surface answer, I fear, but I do have two things to say. I've got my fingers ready. I have two things to say. Visual. In, <laughs> visual, right, <laughs> and peace. Um, so in my own work, what I, what I actually find is uh, when it comes to um, imagery that complements content, in fact, I'm often talking about why the image is neither helping uh, nor conveying any message at all and needs to go. So though as an, as an educator and as a, as a trainer, I almost always teach from the good example that's a principle of my teaching when often when we're talking about web content we just have purely random messageless images that people put on the page because they looked pretty or because the page template requires an image yeah. Yeah. so i think sometimes i'm contributing um, to people's understanding of how the words and the pictures go together by saying your picture has no meaning in, in fact, it's harming your meaning. If you're trying to show, um, for example, you've written content about an on-site workshop you're, you're having and you're promising that it's going to be very interactive and practical, but your image is of a speaker at a podium, that's hurting what you're trying to say there. So that's one theme is just to remind people that your, your images have to carry editorial content. They should, they should almost be able to swap in for the H1 heading on your page. They should, they should like say that. the same thing. Yeah. So, so sometimes I'll help people with the image issue and say, if you could snap your fingers and get the picture you want, what would it look like? You know, that's what you need there or take it off, you know? And the second thing is in the writing courses I offer, I often uh, pause at times and say, here's a blank piece of paper. Can you draw how this page should be laid out? And here's a pencil, like what, do, where would the chunks be? How would you draw it? Because as a writing person myself, the uh, skill gap, that prevents me from creating content that looks the way I want it to is a real skill gap. All the software in the world doesn't turn you into a graphic designer. It's a skill set. So sometimes if somebody can have a writer can have that pencil and paper nearby and they're like, oh, it needs to be two columns. Oh, and would a little color on the back of each help? Yeah. Yeah, but they, they, I think we need, I actually switch tools, like leave the keyboard behind for a moment. Here's some, or post-its or something. Here's something visual switch. I love that. I love that idea. So I know you don't have a crystal ball. Uh, and what I have found is that most of the companies that we work with and companies that we don't work with from all the people I've interviewed have said, they feel like communications has never gotten such a positive spotlight. That people really see the value of communications. They see the damage that bad communications can have, that the quality that can come out of good communications. 
if you were going to tell me, because I'm sort of cynical about it, I'm not so sure how long that goodwill will last, but do you think it will have a lasting effect? I do, because um, I think that employees have changed and customers have changed. So I'll, I'll talk about them as two categories of the receivers of messages. Employees have changed and customers have changed. How have employees changed? Well, they've seen their companies turn on a dime and upend the way work worked. You can't tell me it takes forever to decide. I don't believe you anymore. When it's in your interest, employer, it doesn't take forever to decide. So tell me now, you know, how long will I get to work from home? What are you going to do about the fact that I have human children living in my house and I need to tend to them and do my job, you know? And animal children. And animal children, the furry. We have the furry amongst us. And what are you going to do about um, my uh, civil rights, my rights to speak about what I think in social media and my health rights? Are you going to protect them? Are you going to shape them? And on the other side, customers are, are uh, expecting extreme candor and um, directness from companies. And I don't think that's actually going to go away because here's my other uh, crystal ball. I, apparently, I have one. I can't find it, but I may have one. Um, I, the, the, the real punishing part of the downturn in the economy hasn't happened yet, I don't think. You know, it's going to get worse, even with the new administration, even with the, uh, the uh, funds that we're been promised that will rescue uh, starving families, it's going to get worse. And when it gets worse, more and more customers are going to ask companies to do things they have never asked companies to do before, such as, can you continue my health insurance without me paying for it? You know, can you, I, I need the service and I have no money and no prospects of having money. Nobody ever asked that before, but they're going to be asking it now. And so companies, unless they're going to simply, uh, you know, kick those customers out of the, off the rolls, they're going to have to figure out how to answer those extraordinarily hard questions. So I think we're going to be looking at uh, communication, excellence and growth for a long time because the situations will be so challenging. Um, all right, Leslie, where can people find you? You can find me at eWriteOnline.com. You can find me on Twitter at Leslie O. And if I can put in a mention, we just started a clubhouse room called Plain Language Weekly, meeting Fridays at noon Eastern uh, to talk about plain language. I know, that's so awesome. So um, yeah, I, I hope to join at one point. Me too. It'll be really, really fun. Thank you, Leslie, so much for being here. It's great to have you. Thank you so much, Ahava, and I'll see you over at the bakery. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Just very, very close. <laughs> Thank you.